A couple of weeks ago, we did a deep dive looking closer at the Xbox Series S in order to see if the console was as bad as many gamers say. But that got the gears in my head turning. Can we make a better Xbox Series S? Let's fire up our 3D printer, pick out some better parts, and let's build a better Series S. Hey guys, Turk here, and welcome to the third part of my Console Wars Debunked series. In this series, I've got some major goals I want to accomplish. First, I want to debunk some of the many console war talking points. We accomplished that last week by knocking down the debate between 30 and 60 FPS. Second, I want to explain to you guys some of the tech that's powering our gaming devices. Our first video of the series, we did just that as we dove deep into the Xbox Series S. But for me, what I find more important and more fun is actually making a gaming console. When I started my career as a hardware developer, I worked at IBM qualifying the Cell, Vila, and Obon processors for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. I found it incredibly satisfying to have my hands helping to build and shape the devices I love. However, as technology has advanced and my career moved forward, I moved increasingly into the data center and away from consumer tech. If you've been following the channel for any length of time, you'll notice that I don't really cover handhelds much anymore. That's because I've got a conflict of interest between However, that conflict has reignited my love for prototyping consoles, and I want to take it a step further. As I showed in my PlayStation 5 Pro video, a console's ultimate goal is to become a more accessible PC. The performance this generation, it's almost there, but consoles just lack the customization, openness, and availability of the PC platform. So, what better way to start than making a better Xbox Series S, which I'm going to call the Turkbox Series S. Now, this project isn't just throwing parts into a box and calling it a day. We're making a console here, and we must maintain three different design goals. First, it's got to be small. The Xbox Series S is tiny, coming in with an internal volume of just three liters. The Series X has a bit more room to play with, just below seven liters. The PlayStation 5, with its tall and curvy frame, is anywhere between nine and 10 liters of internal volume. Putting that all into perspective, a mid-sized PC case can be measured anywhere between 40 and 60 liters. That is a giant compared to the consoles. So I want to keep the size as small as possible. Next is power consumption. Again, a typical gaming PC can pull anywhere between 300 and 600 watts from the wall. But from a console perspective, the more power consumption that's required, the beefier power supply you'll need, the bigger cooler, and ultimately the larger chassis it requires. Taking a step back, this looks a lot like the rocket equation. The more power we need to blast off into space, the bigger engines, the more fuel, the larger system, but that makes us need a larger engine, even more fuel and an even larger rocket. And it's just this endless cycle. So ultimately I'm shooting for a PC build that's anywhere between 100 Watts and 200 Watts of total power. Last is resolution. As we discussed in my first video, the Xbox Series S aims for a 1440p display resolution and various render resolutions. Given the size and power supply constraints, 1440p is an ideal sweet spot for an entry to mid-range PC in 2024. Of course, we'll be stepping up to an 8K machine worthy of the Turkbox branding later in the series. So hit subscribe and hit the bell icon to know when that video drops. Now that we've got a design in mind and a performance target, let's make a shopping list. The cornerstone of the build is going to be the case. Since the Series S has an external volume of 4.4 liters, we're going into the super small form factor size. There are many killer designs out there in this form factor that have anodized aluminum, CNC machine. There's even designs that have some wood accents in there. But man, my wallet, it's just not ready for that sort of commitment. And given that we're actually making a console, let's go ahead and 3D print the case. Across the different 3D printed files that I've looked at, there are two different layout configurations, the sandwich and the console. I prefer the console configuration for this build and YouTuber Optimum has designed a sweet case that fits most of the parts I intend to use. 
However, he designs his case around one of those HD Plex power supplies. They are a bit more expensive than I can bear right now, and they're currently out of stock. So Flex ATX is the next best option. Let me know if anyone watching can modify his design to accept Flex ATX, and I'll definitely do a part two of this build. That leaves us with the sandwich style, where the motherboard and GPU are placed back to back within the chassis. It makes for a more cubish build, which I don't really like, but it's gonna have to do. I started with the simple design that I found over on Thingiverse, and at first glance, it looked okay. However, it was an older design, its part list was out of date, and ultimately, after printing, the tolerances were just too tight to build this safely. So back to the drawing board, and I came across this design over on Printables. The Epsilon 570 version 2 created by Alpha Salsa combines the benefits of the first design with improved ventilation, printability, and most critical, assembly. I'll post a link to this case's files and assembly instructions down below because it is a very well designed case and it deserves far more prints from you guys watching. With an improved design, and I intend to make this build last, I'm printing this with ASA filament to handle the high temperatures radiating from the machine. With the parts I've selected, which we'll get to in a bit, I took some initial stress test measurements with temperature and posted those over to the Voidstar Labs Discord. According to the guys over there, they confirmed that my choice of ASA was in fact the right one. PETG might be in that danger zone where we could see some warping. If you'd like to see me talk more about 3D printing and case designs, let me know down in the comments. 3D printing is just way too much to discuss here, but if you're interested in this, I'd love to explore this field a bit further. With our chassis nailed down, some component choices have already forced our hand. But for those of you that want to create a PC part picker list, let's get going. Our system is using a lowly B350 motherboard, but pretty much any mini ITX AM4 based motherboard will work perfectly for this type of build, given our performance and power targets. Next is memory. For a standard low to mid range PC build, two 8GB sticks of DDR4 3200, it's pretty standard these days. However, I plan on taking this even lower in the future so I can get this type of system running with only two gigabytes of RAM, just like the Series S. Next is the processor, you guys know what's coming, the Ryzen 7 3700X. It's a staple in this series and here on this channel, but its eight Zen 2 cores work just fine for games this day and age. However, we wanna keep our power down for this build to better match the Series S, and reduce our cooling requirements. We've got two different options to tackle that. We can either set a static 3.8 gigahertz clock speed or hard code our TDP from anywhere between 50 to 60 watts. Speaking of TDP, I'll be using the AMD Wraith Stealth Cooler, mainly because I already have it lying on hand from one of my 2400G processors, but primarily it's really short at 50 millimeters in height, and that fits perfectly within our case. Storage, all right. I'm gonna be using a meager Gen 3 NVMe drive with only 476 gigabytes of usable storage. It would definitely be a better option to go with a larger capacity drive. So if you're picking parts, definitely go for the larger drive, especially since getting into this case is quite a chore. So buy once and cry once is definitely a good mentality here. The last main boring part is gonna be the power supply. The primary consideration here is the form factor in SFX, it's just too big. Another main benefit for Flex ATX is they're relatively cheap and they're broadly available. Now, the star of the show is the GPU. In my Series S video, we determined that from an off-the-shelf perspective, the potato of a console is very similar to an RX 6500 XT with 8GB of VRAM. It's not a powerhouse by any means, but it does get the job done. But given our performance target and our form factor constraints, what all options are out there? Now that one looks a little bit too big. That one's way too much power. <laughs> Jeez, oh my gosh, that card just sucks. Wait a minute, what do we have here? <laughs> you got it, the RTX A2000. The card is powered just by the slot and requires no extra power cables. It has a half height configuration and it's blower type fan, though not ideal in a desktop, it works perfectly for our use case. 
Not only does the card fit our size and thermal requirements, but it also gives us access to DLSS and effectively cuts our power consumption by over 40 watts. To add that cherry on top, we can slightly overclock this just a bit and increase the memory by 1000 megahertz and the core clock speed by 200 megahertz. It doesn't cost us any additional power or temps, so why not? The only downside here is that this card only has six gigabytes for its VRAM buffer. But as you'll see, we're gonna do just fine with these resolutions and NVIDIA's superior PCI utilization. With the same eight CPU cores as the Series S, but running a bit faster and a GPU built with better technology, I think this is a great combination for our first stab at a homemade gaming console. But talk is cheap and engineering costs money. Let's show y'all some games. I won't be doing a complete performance evaluation here, but I wanna cycle through some of the games that I showed in my Series S video and highlight the improvements that this brings to the table. On the left is gonna be that original Series S footage, and on the right is the 3D printed improved console. All of these games are gonna be running at console equivalent quality settings and resolutions. As always, we start with Cyberpunk 2077. This is my go-to next-gen game, as it stresses graphics quality, resolutions, and frame rates targeting the CPU and the GPU. We eliminate the jitter throughout the benchmark loop by giving the CPU more juice and going above the Series S's 3.4 gigahertz. In addition, the slight overclock on the A2000 enables us to use a higher render resolution than before, going quality mode instead of the console's balanced mode. However, the noteworthy improvement here is DLSS. We removed all the graphical artifacts we encountered with FSR and we got improved clarity thanks to the higher internal render resolution. Next, Forza Horizon 5. It's a similar improvement to Cyberpunk, but way more noticeable. We're hitting roughly the same frame rates as before, but we're no longer stuck at 900p render resolution. This time, we're running the whole native 1440p experience. Now, honestly, can you guys see the difference? Let me know down in the comments. Red Dead Redemption 2, it is a bit less optimistic. We're still using the same settings and render resolution, so we're basically swapping in DLSS instead of FSR. It looks to me a bit more refined, but as I showed in my DLSS versus FSR video, I'll put a card at the top right, it's really hard to tell the difference. It's so close that I even had to use Netflix's quality comparison tools to see if there's actually a difference. And in fact, they're pretty close. Starfield follows suit. Same frame rate, but this time with a reduced render resolution. With the Series S, we use FSR and it scales down to 907p to hit its performance target. Unfortunately, this engine prefers AMD's RDNA GPUs and NVIDIA cards suffer from this. I gotta use DLSS in balanced mode, coming in roughly at 59% scale resolution. In an attempt to get to that coveted 60 FPS in this game, even 720p in performance mode just doesn't quite hit the target in Jemison. Still, DLSS saves the day and the game looks way better than FSR. Unreal Engine 5 and Fortnite in quality mode hammers this 150 watt machine. The 850p resolution looks fine, but I hope to get at least 1080p out of this puppy. Regardless, we are well above the Series S's minimum 540p. Now let's pivot real quick back to Baldur's Gate 3. To this point, we've been focusing on the improvements with the GPU, but how does our increased TDP on the CPU impact the game of the year? Running through Baldur's Gate with DLSS set to balanced mode, we're comfortably in the mid to upper 40s, and we're often getting into the 60s. And if we head down into a dungeon and start a turn-based battle, it's a locked 60 FPS, over a 50% improvement compared to the Series S. When it comes to TDP, I could dial back the CPU even a bit more, but it looks like our cooler can handle this just fine. Rounding out our coverage with Battle.net, Diablo 4 sees decent improvements as well. Despite the lower resolution, DLSS manages to keep the scene looking crisp with much smaller, finer detail throughout. At first, I thought 1440p with DLAA would be just enough to land me a stable 60 FPS. 
but we couldn't quite get there. We had to drop down to quality mode, and that sealed the deal, though nearly delivering 80 FPS in the middle of a Legion battle. That's well above what our RX 6500 XT and the Series S would be capable of delivering. Last but not least, Modern Warfare 3 favors RDNA 2 again, but the A2000 keeps pace very well. With ultra quality settings and DLSS set to balanced mode, 65 FPS, it's no problem. As for the console, it goes down to FSR and performance mode, so this is effectively a huge improvement. However you guys want to spin it, this looks way better and it is substantially improved with DLSS. So, what do you guys think of the first version of the Turk Box Series S? Did we do a good job? Again, the goal here wasn't to make a complete powerhouse of a PC that would curb stomp the Series S. The goal was to refine and improve the formula to deliver a better console experience in the same form factor. Sticking to roughly the same resolutions and performance tier, this build outclasses the potato console in most cases. Along with the horsepower improvement, using NVIDIA's DLSS at these lower resolutions is far superior to the FSR provided with the consoles. So where do we want to take this project from here? I really want to put these components into Optimum's tiniest form factor PC. If any of you guys are CAD modelers, I would be grateful if you could help me out. I just need more time to learn Fusion 360 while still having time to upload videos for you guys. Once the case is sorted out, I've got a few other components I want to try. The obvious choice is to snag the popular RTX 4060 and see how that performs here. Judging by the tech power up rankings, I imagine it's between a PlayStation 5 and an Xbox Series X. If this series gets a lot more traction, I'd love to try that out. But guys, here's a secret. I've got a better small form factor GPU to try out. <laughs> However, until I have that case on my printer, there are plenty of console war talking points to debunk. Over on Twitter, I can think of three off the top of my head. Uh, what does frame generation bring to the console? Do gamers really hate sub 1080p render resolutions? And what will an actual next generation Xbox look like? I've seen a lot of rumors and I've got thoughts on all of these different topics, but you'll have to subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends in order to make that happen. In the meantime, quit console warring and get busy gaming, my friends.